Hey, what's up everyone and welcome to today's video. This episode will guide you through the issues of... This channel's regular broadcast is interrupted for a special coverage of the first appearance of Rogue in Avengers Annual 10, published by Marvel Comics in 1981. The Avengers, otherwise known as Earth's Mightiest Heroes, are an assembly of heroes who band together to protect planet Earth and its inhabitants. Against both foes of Earth itself, as well as extraterrestrial threats, that no single hero can stand against. They started out when the mighty Asgardian Thor got tricked into fighting the Incredible Hulk due to a ploy of the trickster Loki, Thor's half-brother. Thor was helped by a team of the original members, Iron Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Eventually it became clear it was all Loki's trickery and the Hulk joined the Avengers. Not for long though, as he would soon leave the team. Other members soon joined, and the cast of active and reserve members grew rapidly over the years. At the time of this comic, the active members of the team are the former X-Men Beast, Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, Scarlet Witch and Vision, Hawkeye, Jocasta and Wonder Man. Avengers Annual Number 10 Welcome to San Francisco, America's gateway to the Pacific, home of the Golden Gate Bridge. Apart from it being a tourist attraction, sadly it has been chosen by many people over the years as a place to end their lives prematurely. But once in a while, someone gets pushed. In this case, it's a young blonde woman. Luckily she never reaches the water because Jessica Drew, the superhero known as Spider-Woman, is there to catch her and save her. Or at least she tries to. Relying on winds to glide on with a web like wings under her arms and carrying the extra weight, she plummets down into the water as the winds die down. In a desperate attempt, she turns her body towards the water, making sure it's she who catches the brunt of the impact. The water is ice cold and she worries about the effect the temperature will have on the victim whom she's carrying along with her through the water as she tries to make her way to the shore. It's quite the distance to the shore, either way, but Jessica Drew makes a valiant effort, and the thought of having to abandon the blonde haired woman never enters her mind, regardless of how hard the struggle it will be. Once the sun comes up, Jessica is waiting for a lieutenant of the San Francisco Police Department to show up in the hospital she brought the blonde woman to. The lieutenant shows up in the lobby, where a young girl exits the hospital. Jessica tells the lieutenant that she's about to hear about the victim's status from the doctors, but it's somewhat disturbing news. The lieutenant herself has some news as well, as they were able to dig up some info about the woman thanks to the fingerprints they received. The doctor tells a worried spider woman that the lady will live and that there's nothing physically wrong with her, but as far as she can tell, her mind is non-existent. It seems to function at the level of a newborn infant, she suggests to contact all the mental institutions in the area, because she suspects that's where she came from, but the lieutenant has to correct her. The fingerprints belong to Carol Susan Jane Denvers, a US Air Force major of high standing. Last known residence, however, was in Greenwich Village, New York, and she apparently went missing about six months ago. Apparently Carol had been stripped of all form of identification, even down to the labels in her clothes. Her assailant clearly wanted to make her as anonymous and as untraceable as possible. They will need all the help they can get to get into the woman's mind and to try and find out what happened to her. And Jessica knows just who to get into contact with to get this done. Back to New York, to the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, secretly the home of the mutant superheroes the Uncanny X-Men. The youngest mutant named Kitty Pride answers Jessica's phone call and she tells her she will get the professor for her. He's currently at the Danger Room, repairing the observation booth with Nightcrawler and Storm. Kitty uses her powers to face through the walls of the booth to inform the professor, and Storm asks her who it is. Kitty tells Aurora it's Spider-Woman, and Kurt teleports inside of the Danger Room, where Colossus and Wolverine, two other members of the X-Men, are tending to the machinery right there. A lot had been destroyed during a fight Kitty had with a demon inside a big part of the mansion, leaving a lot of chaos in its wake. 
Wolverine asks Kurt if he's sure everything will work again now as he's about to turn the power back on. They've been working on this since breakfast and Kurt is pretty sure it should all work again. He and Kitty checked everything three times over. Right before Kurt presses the buttons, the professor ends the call with Spider-Woman, agreeing that his special expertise could be of some help and he will see her in San Francisco this afternoon. The electronics short circuit and there's a big explosion in the booth. Luckily, Kitty isn't hurt, but apparently it's back to the drawing board. Only Storm and Xavier travel to San Francisco and Xavier starts examining Carol. The lieutenant has been in contact with Carol's parents and they took the news of the daughter pretty hard. They also said that there might be some answers gotten from the Avengers and Miss Marvel, which confuses the lieutenant a bit. Considering the kind of unusual case this is, the lieutenant welcomes any form of help. The professor reaches out telepathically to Spider-Woman, who is surprised by this. She did not know the professor to be a mutant, and he explains that he prefers to keep his abilities a secret, as much as he can, just like she does her secret identity of Jessica Drew. He tells Spider-Woman that Carol's mind seems to have been completely erased on the surface. Even though there are some residual memories and personality traits buried deep within her subconscious mind. He thinks he can help her, given the proper time, effort and luck. He also tells Spider-Woman that her suspicions were right. Carol is, or was, a strong and courageous woman who fought hard to protect herself. Xavier's preliminary scan picked up a subconscious residual image of a woman. He believes this woman to have been her assailant and she goes by the name of Rogue. Captain America, the living legend of World War II, has seen better days. He is being attacked and brutally beaten in Central Park, New York, by the exact same woman Carol Danvers had been last night. And with Rogue now having absorbed Miss Marvel's powers, Captain America never really had a chance. Moreover, not only does Rogue possess Miss Marvel's powers, but also her memories, resulting in her knowing what to expect in a fight with her teammate. She kisses the unconscious Captain on the lips, thereby making sure that she absorbs his powers as well. But this time around, unlike with Carol Danvers, she will make sure it won't be too long. Because somehow, the absorption of Carol's powers and memories turned out to be permanent. At the same time, not too far away, as a matter of fact pretty close by, Captain America's teammates the Avengers are having their weekly team meeting. The remaining members are having some chit chat, while Jarvis the butler is pouring drinks and serving them food. Beast is wondering what their team leader is, since it's unlike him to not be there on time. At that exact moment, as if on cue, the seemingly lifeless body of Captain America is being thrown through one of the windows of the room they're all in. Some of the members immediately tend to him, while some of the other members rush out to see if they can find anyone responsible for this. At the headquarters of Stark International, we find Tony Stark who's working on his Iron Man armor when the Avengers priority alarm goes off. He already had told the team's leader that he would not be present at today's scheduled meeting and they wouldn't call him unless things were deadly serious. The other members do not know Tony Stark is the one inside the Iron Man armor as their teammate, so he uses his high-tech machinery to make a projection of him wearing the suit as he answers the call. He soon finds out how serious the situation is exactly, as Jarvis informs him of the attack on Captain America. Iron Man will make sure that him and Dr. Blake will be there soon. The Vision returns and reports him, telling everyone that he searched the surroundings and Central Park, but he could not find anything suspicious. As Tony Stark puts on his armor and is getting ready to leave for the mansion, his assistant tells him he has a visitor. He then tells his assistant to cancel all his appointments but to send the visitor in, who is Janet Van Dyne, the former Avenger by the codename of the Wasp. When she enters, she's surprised to find Iron Man there, and not Tony Stark. But he tells her he had to rush out, as will he. He tells his former teammate that he's happy she's here, and that they could use both her and her husband the Yellow Jacket's help. He tells her that Captain America has been attacked and is seriously hurt right now. She asks him if he's doing okay, and tells him that of course they will help, as she reaches inside of her purse. Iron Man tells her that it's way too soon to tell anything about Captain America's current state, as Janet put some kind of device on the back of his armor. He asks her what she's doing, because he can't move anymore. 
Janet then tells him that this device renders all power systems completely dysfunctional, as he sees her change into a different person altogether right before his eyes. She mocks him as she tells him she is not Janet Van Dyne at all, but Mystique, the leader of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and Captain America's attacker is her accomplice. She contacts Rogue through a transmitter and tells her to proceed with the plan, and she also tells Iron Man that her friends will never know what hit them. At the same time, Jessica Drew, the Spider-Woman, arrives in New York at the Avengers Mansion. She travels back to New York City along with Storm on the X-Men's Blackbird, but they left Professor Xavier behind with Carol, to see what he can do for her. As she steps out of the taxi, she thinks about the current situation and what would be the proper approach to finding out the connection between Carol Danvers and the Avengers, which Carol's mother alluded to. She spots a woman in green running into the surface alley of the mansion and immediately recognizes her as the woman Professor X showed her a mental image of. The woman who he thinks attacked Carol. Behind the mansion, the Asgardian Avenger Thor arrives, landing and immediately changing into his alter ego of Dr. Donald Blake. He received the message from Tony Stark and knows that if Tony mentions the situation with Captain America being a dire one, it most likely is. He has fought side by side with Cap many a times and knows that he is not one to easily get hurt this bad. At this moment in time, the captain needs the physician Blake more than he needs his ally Thor. Once he has changed into Donald Blake, he gets struck from behind by Rogue. But as she takes off her glove, she herself is getting attacked from behind by Spider-Woman, who has been waiting to take revenge on Rogue for what she's done and tried to do to Carol. Spider-Woman's costume pretty much totally covers her body much to Rogue's chagrin, since that way it won't be as easy to render her unconscious and steal her powers. She's able to push Spider-Woman off her, noticing how she hasn't been able to hit her due to her superhuman speed and agility. At the same time, Donald Blake is trying to reach his cane, in order to be able to tap it against the ground, which would trigger his transformation back into Thor. Eventually he's able to do so and grabs a hold of Rogue, not realizing that by doing so he actually hands Rogue the chance to absorb his powers by touching his face and wrist. Spider-Woman sees this unfold and tries to stop it before the transfer of power has been completed. So she attacks Rogue with one of her Venom Blasts, a bioelectric bolt shooting from her fingertips. But sadly, it has no effect whatsoever. The rest of the Avengers inside the mansion are coming outside, after hearing all the noise and are surprised to see what's going on. They don't recognize the woman that's holding Thor, but the Vision does recognize Spider-Woman. Drawing instant conclusions from the state Thor is in and how close Rogue is standing to him, he thinks her to be the more evident threat and approaches Rogue and tries to deal with her first. With the Vision being an android instead of a human, and Rogue being aware of this, she knows she can't use her powers on him. She knows she will have to destroy him and Mystique has told her exactly how he fights. She knows that he will try and use his density altering powers on her. So she uses Thor's body as some kind of shield between the two of them, which stops the Vision in his tracks, and then knocks him out instantly, with one single punch. Next Wonder Man, Simon Williams, attacks her. He flies straight into her, thinking that he would be able to get her away from Thor, or at least push her off balance. Not knowing, she currently possesses the combined powers of Thor, Captain America and Ms. Marvel. Simon is shocked to hear that she also has the powers of Ms. Marvel, as Rogue grabs him by the throat. She touches his skin, trying to add his powers as well, but his skin isn't really skin. Simon is not a human either, as she notices by looking him in the eyes after she knocked off his sunglasses. Simon is a being of sentient energy, extremely powerful but just as useless to Rogue as the Vision was, and she deals with him about the same way, by throwing him away like garbage. Rogue realizes that her and Mystique miscalculated Rogue's chances, even though she thinks she could probably kill them all, but she doesn't want to risk what's at stake. If she fails, Mystique wouldn't be pleased at all, because right now she's needed somewhere else. So she retreats, sending out a clear warning that this will be settled at a later time. As she flies off, Hawkeye asks Spider-Woman what she's doing here, so Jessica starts explaining. During the evening, when things have settled down a bit, Jessica explains to some of the Avenger members what had happened to Carol, about how she seemingly vanished from New York for about three months, and then appeared again in San Francisco about three months ago, living a calm life, until last night, when she had been attacked and someone tried to kill her. She also tells him that she's working together with the San Francisco Police Department and about their suspicion of Rogue being the assailant. Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, tells her that she had only been an Avenger for a relatively short time 
and that she was probably closest to her, even though in retrospect she probably wasn't that close at all. Simon adds that she was a very private person, who was very self-reliant, often mistaken as an emotionless ice maiden. Wanda then continues telling Jessica about how they were walking on the beach and Carol suddenly collapsed. Somehow she was experiencing morning sickness and appeared to have been three months pregnant, according to her biological clock. And then, in less than a week, she carried the baby to full term and gave birth to her son. And that son had grown to manhood in less than a day. As it turned out, the child she gave birth to was actually the son of Immortus, who had implanted his own essence inside of her through some form of machinations, using Carol by seducing her to be able to escape Immortus' domain of Limbo. In the end, Marcus was still connected to the dimension of Limbo and this created a disruption in the local time stream, causing the Earth to be flooded with dinosaurs, spaceships and knights in armor and such. Marcus was building a machine in the meantime, which, as he said, would save the day but no one really trusted him. Everything happened so fast and Hawkeye chose to destroy the machine which resulted in Marcus not being able to stay on Earth, and he had to return to Limbo. And Carol, having fallen in love with Marcus and vice versa, joined him. And Thor helped create a dimensional rift between Earth and Limbo. And so they left, hopefully to live happily ever after. Apparently, it didn't last for long since Carol had returned back to Earth, without Marcus. Which makes Spider-Woman ask the question, why didn't she contact the Avengers, still having her powers and whatnot. At that moment, Beast and Jocasta entered the room, and Spider-Woman asks how the pages are doing. He tells her that compared to the data she got on Carol's state, Cap and Thor seem to be doing a lot better. Their state seems to be temporary, but he has no idea how long it will last. He then asks about Iron Man, but there has been no response from him whatsoever. They will have to expect the worst. Rogue seems to perfectly know what she's doing, as she has taken out the strongest and most experienced members, and Jessica mentions that even if they are to find her, Beating her will not be that easy at all. Beast tells her to take it one step at a time. They will have to find her first. Luckily, Miss Marvel's hybrid alien Kree metabolism is easily traced. And Spider-Woman seems to know exactly where she's headed. And if she's right, their troubles have only just begun. At midnight, an aircraft arrives at Rikers Island. Formerly a city jail, but recently turned into a prison of the federal government, used for the incarceration of apprehended supervillains. One of such inmates is the blind woman Irene Adler, codenamed Destiny, a woman possessing the powers of precognition, but also a member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and she tells her fellow inmates to be ready because deliverance is at hand. From the aircraft, Tony Stark helplessly encased in aesthetic armor, gets thrown towards the prison by road. She aimed him straight at the main generator room and the impact has the force of a small nuclear bomb. With the generator down, the massive energy fields which are being used to contain most of the super criminals in their cells are disrupted, with devastating results. And before the reserve generators come online, four specific inmates who had been forewarned know how and when to use this attack for their own prison break. Two of these are the mutants, Destiny and her teammate Fred Dukes, also known as the Blob. Their two other incarcerated teammates are Avalanche and Pyro. Pyro helps to guide the blind Destiny, while Avalanche uses his ability to pave them away through the prison, crumbling every solid object in their way and moving them along as if he's creating an instant avalanche or tidal wave. Pyro asks Destiny if they will be able to pull this off, but she tells him that nothing in the future is certain until it happens. All she can do is perceive the many pathways to the future and determine which ones are most likely to happen. But she can't disregard the element of chance. Having arrived in the courtyard, the four of them are reunited with Mystique and their newest addition to the team, Rogue. Destiny, the Blob Pyro and Avalanche had been taken to prison after their failed attempt to assassinate the Senator Robert Kelly. They had been defeated by the X-Men, but Mystique was able to escape. Destiny does tell them to hurry up. But Rogue already sees that it's too late, because the Avengers have arrived, and they've assembled to stop this attempt at a jailbreak and take revenge on Rogue and Mystique for their fallen teammates. They are here to make sure that this time around, all the members of the Brotherhood will be incarcerated. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it. 
You can help growing this channel by hitting the like button and by subscribing. This tells YouTube that the videos I'm making should be recommended to others and would be very much appreciated. See you next episode.